Well, we already had a quick introduction, but my name is Joey Malecki. I was working up at Cooking Company. Here's a nice picture of our building here. And let's move on. So uh, what here? what is PPI? That's what I was doing my internship through. PPI stands for Pollution Prevention Institute. Um, it's ran through K-State here at the Younger Complex and also in part with EPA. And it this year we had 14 interns that working all over Kansas. Uh, and on the website, it is cited over 30,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent has been reduced and $22 million have been saved. Uh, and our purpose is to reduce, eliminate, or prevent pollution at its source. And we do that through this beautiful diagram I'm sure you've seen it already. Uh, so start off the most uh, optimal method of pollution and prevention would be directly at the source reduction. Uh, some, not all methods can necessarily go through this. So sometimes you might need to go down to reusing materials or recycling back into. Uh, the reason these are less advantageous is because the materials tend, materials tend to be used and some will be some sort of waste associated with that. And also certain energies lost. Uh, but then uh, some options that are better than nothing would be treatment such as regaining some of the thermal energy associated with that material, such as burning off excess wood. And then last option would be simple disposal or release of the material. So where I worked uh, this past summer was up in Seneca, Kansas. It is a good 72 miles away from Manhattan, Kansas. Nice hour long drive I had made it every day. Uh, it's got a population of over 2,000 people. I was formerly on the Pony Express, home of a Super Bowl MVP. It has over two gas stations and oh wait, um, four <laughs> restaurants. One did close down in the middle of the internship. Uh, and also it's located between the three college towns of Manhattan, Lawrence, and Lincoln. So you get a nice good mix of uh, college sports fandom. So company I was working with is Cooking Company. They are a wooden cabinet and door manufacturer located in Seneca, founded there in 1989 by three Cook brothers. Uh, it currently has over 700 employees across their 12 locations in three states, the other states being South Carolina and Tennessee. Four of their locations are in the area of Seneca. And what they make is over 10,000 style combinations of cabinets, um, along with various different sizing options. And the four locations in Seneca are called Midland, which uses the Midland uh, series of cabinets. The door plant, which makes doors. Frameless, which is frameless types of cabinets and cabinets, which makes cabinets. <laughs> Oops, I double skipped. All right, so my objectives for this internship that I was tasked, uh, I got three tasks. Uh, first was compressed air leaks. I, was, I went around the four plants looking for leaks in their compressed air system. This was a main, mainly a task to help me get acquainted with the area that I was working in. It was about two weeks, uh, recommended solutions here. Uh, then we went on to a solvent distiller, which you can see up there, uh, looking at if we the validity of getting a solvent distiller installed in the plant, and then a some solid waste production at the end, kind of just cleaning up some loose ends. So the compressed air leaks, uh, how that whole process works is we get this uh, sound detection unit called the UE9000. It was on the previous page. It kind of looks like a, a newsy. It's bad. It really does though. Uh, and it can detect the sound of a leak as you go, walk around a plant uh, and pr puts it in through your earphones that you're wearing. Uh, and it will take certain readings like sound, the decibel reading from the leak, how much pressure, you, you will enter that in a location and you enter that all on an app and you will be able to project how much cost it'll it's costing per year. Uh, specifically, these are what the leaks would tend to look like. They are usually at they're usually at junk sinks here. Uh, a lot of this uh, sawdust will chill around the leak because a lot of sawdust is out in the plants. Uh, that's enough. That's a good telltale sign of a leak being present. And then once you have all this information, there's a nice app you can enter all of it in. So if the company that makes the app UE, 
they are able to give you a spreadsheet giving you all the leaks, all their total costs of that it's getting putting on the company, uh, along with power that it's costing, and gives you a nice uh, list of what the leaks are. So after my report, I found over 150 leaks across the four plants, and it was estimated that it was costing the company about over 1.3 million kilowatt hours, and which amounts to $78,000 uh, based on 55.5 cents per kilowatt hour, which is the going rate of electricity in Seneca. And for repairing these leaks, the medium repair cost was estimated to be about $15 per leak. Uh, that's based off of about $7 for the material to replace it. Because if we go back here, most of the, sorry, uh, most of these leaks can be replaced by this simple uh, metal fitting. It costs about seven or eight bucks. Uh, and then also another $8 would be towards the actual labor to repair these leaks. Um, specifically, I have a table here of all the types that I found. Roughly, I would categorize these types of leaks. This is a connect type leak, which is the vast majority. And then attachment is also really similar, just a slightly slightly different uh, set of parts, but in general, the same thing. Uh, Raptors leaks, those are up in the Raptor system of uh, compressed air throughout the factory. Uh, those are actually a little harder to reach and would cost more to fix because you need to get a scissor lift to get up to them. And then broken hoses and miscellaneous leaks are uh, just kind of filling out the rest of the types. Right. And if we did, if all the leaks were repaired, it would save approximately 1,374 metric tons of carbon dioxide. Uh, should I would like to note though that some of these are a little bit of underestimates because for the UE app, it only takes pressure increments in 25 PSI and a lot of the PSI readings were either 80 or 120 PSI. And typically we would round those down to 75 and 100 PSI. Uh, it's also an, an, another reason this is likely underestimating is because any leaks in the rafters you need to get really close with the UE to assess how powerful the leak is. Uh, and I couldn't exactly reach up all the way to the ceiling because it's very tall. And uh, so I would typically put down just 30 decibels as the reading given, even though sometimes it'd be even louder from a really far distance, uh, meaning that a lot of those leaks are um, actually losing more power than what the report says. Uh, but after this, I went on to looking at a solid distiller here. Uh, it was proposed mainly because the VOC permitted at the plant was uh, near what was actually being the emissions were. Uh, permits gave 245 tons of VOCs per year, and it was around 220, so only about 25 VOCs was the limit. Uh, and they were also uh, wanting to save some money from recycling these solvents. And uh, another important concern is that there was a distiller there previously, but there were lots of complaints with it based on how it smelled. It, it gave us this horrible odor, uh, wasn't very useful, and employees had trouble operating it. So the questions I had to answer, of course, were how long would it take for this to be paid back? Uh, how effective would this solvent be that's recycled? Uh, where is this going to go and how is it going to smell? But uh, I will end up looking at this specific store here. It's called the uh, made by Becca Inc. It recycles 17.5 gallons per cycle. It can be around about three times a year. Uh, it one isn't actually enough to cover what the plant uses in a day. Um, and Becca makes a larger version, but that couldn't be produced within a few months. So we were decided you know, to run with this specific distiller since it could be made earlier and also to see just kind of how it would work well in the, in the company. And then if a larger distiller was wanted, we move this to a different location. Uh, and how it works, so what you do is you take your bucket of waste here 
and you go ahead and pour it into your distiller uh, and then it'll run for about six or eight hours. It heats up the waste. Uh, usually the ratio of solid waste to solvent is 20% solid, 80% solvent. And that 80% of what you end up normally throwing away is actually useful stuff that can be used again. Uh, and then the machine will heat up the waste, uh, evaporating the solvents, but leaving the solids as solids. And the solvents will condense down into a nice liquid flow into a separate bucket. And then what you do is you take your waste and uh, not necessarily check it out, but <laughs> it gets disposed of as hazardous waste, like the, the currently is. Um, and what I found uh, for this, not this specific size distiller, but we were able to get in contact with a local company that had a smaller version made by the company, Becca Inc. And we did a test run of waste and we found that there was no smell. The solvent that we got back, we ended up conducting a test on that, which I will get into in one second. And also that it was covering about 70% of total waste ended up becoming a usable solvent. Uh, and then also, uh, this location would likely be where the waste is currently being stored in this site shed, uh, where it can be shaded, uh, while the waste is already being currently funneled in towards there, just probably need to put some walls in there. And specifically for the test, what, what happened was the claimed solvents and then two solvents that were currently used. This is a lower strength solvent and a higher strength solvent, it's also cheaper. And uh, we poured up with a plank that had been given 12 coats of varnish approximately, uh, let it sit for about a whole day, saw how well we ate off those 12 layers of varnish, found that they were roughly equal, uh, across all three actually, but the stronger solvent that at one point definitely showed signs of being the strongest, but definitely these two were very similar in strength. And then after that, uh, we cooked the remaining solvent and had a worker use it to clean his uh, paint line machine. Uh, he's been working there for a few years. Uh, and he said that he felt that there was no difference between that solvent and the normal solvent and that it worked really well. So uh, conclusion here is that not only is this going to save the company 50 tons of VOCs per year, but also save about $200,000 from combined solvents recycled and, and reused and also limiting waste costs. Uh, and also that since the solvent is effective and it's been confirmed, we have, the company has gone and purchased this specific distiller. It's not gonna arrive till after I'm already in classes, which is really sad for me because I really wanted to test her out, but it's okay. It's gonna, it's gonna help the company out. And after that, I went on to doing uh, some solid waste work. Uh, I first started off uh, with in being in the paint line area for about two days, just observing practices, seeing areas that could be improved upon. Uh, the first thing I noticed was the spray uh, belts. This is a spray belt, one of the many spray belts in the plants. Uh, it's on a paper belt. Uh, that ends up gets used once and then uh, disposed of in a specific way, not as high as real waste, but also not as strong as what it felt good. Uh, and what I saw here specifically was this uh, wood. And one second, it'll hit the wood and kind of catch up in a big cloud, kind of like when you. Uh, you're like spraying a window cleaner on a window, a lot of it come, kind of comes back onto you. Uh, so I was thinking that the pressure of these spray heads might be really high, higher than what should what it should be, causing some overspray, which would then get picked up by filters. Uh, so I looked at some transfer efficiency uh, with, with these sprayers and uh, between also spray belts and hand spray guns. Uh, what I did, I have the ports here. Uh, sorry for the online uh, viewers, but mm -hmm. this is something you really have to see in person to fully understand. But uh, I, 
uh, I took two sets of doors. I had the paint line supervisor paint one at the normal pressure, just like she normally would. Uh, saw how much paint was used to get that specific quality he wanted. Then I had him paint it the same way, but at the lower pressure, uh, based off of the gun's recommended pressure. Uh, and then I found that actually more paint was used at lower pressures and that the resulting quality, you can come up here later and see. This is a 30 PSI. If you look at it, there's a lot of bumps on it, a lot of paint depression, not necessarily a high enough quality. Then the higher pressure ones, they're just like this. So if you just want this nice and smooth overall coating. And essentially, my conclusion was uh, first off, this was a really small sample size, so it's hard to make broad conclusions. But I, my guess is that it's going to take more qual more paint to approach the quality of higher pressures used by the guns, uh, and th that's why I think the guns should probably operate as at their current pressures, except for the one that I took the video of. That one was abnormally high, even for. Uh, the high pressures that are being used. That one, uh, unless there's a reason given uh, for quality concerns, it probably should be turned down. Uh, that's my spray head pressure uh, observations. And then I went on to looking at solid waste from the, uh, that comes from the paint line. Uh, there's the paper rolls, which are used on those spray beds, uh, rags that are used for solvents, I'm sorry, wood stains, the, you take, uh, for wood stains, you have to take rags to wipe in solvents so that it gets a good even coat coat on there uh, and also to absorb any excess stains. Um, and then also paint filters. Um, so first with uh, paper rolls, based on how they're used in the machines, there's not really a way to reduce their use because they run, they run through the machine at a constant speed. It's not really controlled by the operator. They can't be really reused, and the only way to eliminate their use would be to just not use paper or roll machines, which would cost a few million dollars to replace those. Uh, it's not necessarily, that can't be justified economically. And then I was looking at these solvent wipe down rags, like stain wipe down rags. Uh, and my thought process, well, Linnell also, uh, help with this that they could be laundered instead of what they're current what's currently happening which they're just thrown into a giant plastic bag which is shipped to shawnee county i believe disposed of because it's a specific landfill there that's used to dispose of these um, solvent rags stain rags sorry. uh so my thought was that we could get the gigantic washing machine that they have in hotels uh launder them on site so that no, they wouldn't have to be shipped across town to be cleaned because there's no local town nearby that'll that's able to clean it um and that would reduce the actual rag use the solvents would the stains would still be uh wasted but at least the rags which are it's forty dollars for a box and about five boxes are used a week roughly and the rags are just they're used once and then they're thrown away i uh, would re extend their life cycle by it significantly. The only problem with this specific uh, solution is that the city of Seneca would need to approve of the wastewater from the washing machine. I've contacted them, but I've, I wasn't able to really get anything going by the time back. And it's also not typically something the pollution prevention intern would do. So this specific solution was just considered recommended at the end. Uh, and also more is more needs more research and my last thing i looked at was these paint filters uh the main and a good solution for reducing your paint filter waste uh is i have a nice little animation i made kind of show what it would be like but you essentially do a rotation of filters half the size so you'll take like one filter and, and then another filter and like this thickness would be normally the amount of filters that you have currently. And what's theoretically supposed to happen is that the top filter will be contaminated and get dirty, while the bottom filter will remain relatively clean. 
and usable. And then once this filter needs to be replaced, you take it off, move the bond to the top, and then add a new filter on the bottom. And that's like, and you roughly reducing filter use by half. The only problem with that, I don't know what happens. Okay. Joe, you have about five minutes. Okay, yeah. Uh, problem is that the filter use, there's not a whole lot of consistency across all the plants and the filters. A one type is really thin, but all the paint gets really on the surface. So having two filters doesn't necessarily add any benefit because uh, a lot of things that you're getting through the surface. And then the second filter was a lot better in the fact that it gets throughout it, but it gets it so evenly within the uh, material of the filter that uh, it, even if you would just take half of the top off, the bottom half would be roughly equal to contaminated. So it's not quite as easy. It, the method wouldn't be effective in that sense. So this specific uh, uh, pollution prevention method was not recommended. And that brings me to my summary. So my net annual savings from the first two projects, which were ones that were completed or recommended, was about $248,000 per year. Uh, that's cost um, deducted from that. Uh, and pollution prevented was well, 1,434 under carbon dioxide, mainly from the reduced power use from the air leaks. About 52 tons of VOCs, which is very important for the plant since they're uh, that'll give them a lot more space to work with the permit. And then almost 20 tons of hazardous air pollutants because the solvents used uh, there tend to have a little bit of extra those. And these things worked out. And also, there could potentially be more in the future with the uh, other methods that need just a little more work uh, fully. Uh, have their benefits. Uh, the end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Oh, my dad? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Uh, maybe if I... Don't, don't I believe the water? Yeah, uh, say it again. Yeah. Yeah, it would be laundered on site. Um, I believe, is that all he's asking? Yes, that's why um, the city of Seneca would need to uh, understand, like understand exactly what's going on there. Because I also thought uh, their water treatments within the city would need to be able to handle it before for me specifically to be comfortable saying we should we should be washing these rags because also not only is the wood stain going into the wastewater but there will also be bleaches and other cleaning chemicals going in so definitely something that uh, would need to be looked at uh, make sure that the the city yeah the city public works can handle it because uh, it's a permitted process. Yeah. Right. And so we actually told Joey, you know, hey, it's <laughs> it's compliance and will help with that, mm -hmm. but he did not it's, I'm just gonna help you out a little bit. It is required, it's a permitted process, you cannot uh, it's commercial laundered regs. And so unless you've got a preacher on site pre treatment, which I doubt you want to do that, that's a lot of money, not for regs, <laughs> and then you have to, you know, somehow see if the city wanted to accept it and treat it themselves. But then, of course, they'll charge you. Yeah. It depends how much you just charge. It's very little that it's okay. Yeah. You know, the, it's more than that. But it has to be like that. Yeah, the, there's a lot of wrecks that are going. I estimate about 150 kilograms per day. Um, I don't know what that is in freedom units, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, definitely a, a lot of rags are being used there. Um, yeah. 
Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs> Have you. What solvent were you recycling? Are you putting people recycling? So it's uh, there's three there are three uh mixed solvent mixes made. Uh, two of them are made by Barsol. Uh, another one's through Sherwin Williams directly. Uh, there are big, large mix chemicals. A lot, the big ones in it are like toluene and uh, methanol. So not not the uh some not super duper nasty, but also not super duper clean. Uh, 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 I was also concerned with like uh, chemicals mixing in and maybe diluting the power of the solvents, uh, sp specifically because the paints used also have uh, a lot of those chemicals in there, uh, which is why we wanted to make sure that the solvent strength held up. Any other questions? It's more of a comment. I that's really surprising about the uh, the painting and the pressure level. Of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I really would if I had uh, more time, more of not just my time, but uh, time to use for resources, uh, mainly human resources. There, I would want to do a lot more experiments on that and stuff. But uh, production is uh, kind of backed up, and I didn't want to be super burdensome to the two workers there. Like. Hey, yeah, can you go ahead and pay me five, 15, 15 cabinet doors that'll never actually be sold? Uh, so yeah, I try. I, I took, I have my data. I, I want to make sure that statistics about it are known. But yeah, the the worker who did it is very experienced, so I wouldn't say worker errors. Anything else? Uh, and so that's a good, that's a really good comment because I was really surprised by that too. So usually if we get an HPLC high volume, yes. low pressure, you get a better finish. Sometimes it's just a matter of training for the employees because there is a way of you know getting a more a better uh, and more finish with an HPLC. Mm -hmm. And then you'll use about 30, sometimes 50% less paint drop to it. Yeah, I, uh, my uh, little experiment here, another problem with this experiment is the only skill we had was not super accurate for the mass differences we were measuring. Uh, and that was definitely a problem, but I estimated around 60% transfer efficiency between both of them based on uh, possible error in the uh, scale, um, which is roughly what you expect with HVLP guns. The guns specifically had, they advertise up to 87% transfer efficiency, but that's also at lower pressures. And I'm assuming also they don't, Aren't a necessary concern as qual about quality. Um, yeah. Yeah, good number. Yeah, and a lot of the paint painting done there on the is on these automatic lines. L lot little is done by actual spray guns, and the workers that I saw doing them tended to appear at least fairly skilled compared to. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the difference in our industry is that where a canvas used to be a solid wood with a stain and a varnish on it, now almost, I would say 80% of what we do is painted, mm -hmm. so your solids are higher. So even though you have a high pressure, low volume done, you have to get, a, you have to get some pressure there to get those solids out. So, but we have those four four facilities we have like twelve automated machines mm -hmm. and twenty some a lot of pieces crews for people spraying mm -hmm. and doing stuff. It's, it's uh yeah very vast operation. That's why I Billy to her but for him to understand what we do in a very short amount of time it, it was it was hard and he really did a good job. Thank you. All right, I think I'm well over my time. <laughs>